welcome everyone today. Uh, we're so delighted to see all of you. Um, and thank you to all of uh, the alumni for taking the time to join us here today. Um, we're happy to host this conversation between students and English and cultural studies graduates. And a huge thank you to uh, Nina and the alumni team at McMaster for helping to organize this event. Uh, I will be one of your co-hosts for this evening and my name is Sarah. Hi there, my name is Mason. I'm one of the other co-hosts. And I just wanted to start off with a short land acknowledgement um, before we start. So while we're taking this event from different parts of the country and perhaps the globe, um, we would like to recognize and acknowledge that McMaster is located on traditional territories of the Mississaugas and the Haudenosaunee nations, which is, in, which is within the land protected by the Dish With One Spoon wampum belt. So a wampum belt, is a bead or beads wound onto strings that narrate the Haudenosaunee history, traditions, and laws. And the dish with one spoon, wampum, was to bind the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy to the great law of peace. And the dish represents the shared land, while the one spoon reinforces the idea of sharing and peace. Uh, we are all guests on this territory where we currently have the privilege to study, live, and work. And it's important to acknowledge the original inhabitants of this land and the history they share with this land as a step toward reconciliation. Thank you, Mason. Um, so as an agenda for today's event, we'll be starting with a brief introduction of what we do as an English and Cultural Studies Society, um, as well as a brief uh, introduction to each of our lovely al alumni. Um, we'll then proceed with some questions that we've prepared to sort of start the ball rolling um, before we move on to a Q&A where you, the students, can ask your burning questions directly to our lovely guest. Um, so without further ado, um, let's begin. Um, so first, to introduce ourselves, um, we have a couple exec members here from the McMaster English and Cultural Studies Undergraduate Society, um, Mason, myself, Claire and Hiru are all part of uh, the exec team. Um, as the society, we host online weekly discussions for students to chat with their peers and ge geek out on English topics like the books we love. A couple of times this semester, we also hold larger in-person events or virtual. <laughs> this year, we met for drinks, went to the theaters, shared our creative writing with one another, and are now connecting students with uh, these wonderful grads. Um, we also run the peer-reviewed undergraduate journal Spectrum, which spotlights short stories, poetry, essays, and think pieces that push boundaries or give viewpoints from communities that are less likely to find their works in print. Uh, our second edition of Spectrum is currently in the works, uh, and we expect to publish it this spring. In the chat, we'll put all of our socials or social channels uh, so you can join or reach out to us. And we will also be holding elections for our exec team for next year. So be sure to follow us on social media to get all of the details on when that will be and for more information on how you can be a part of creating events just like this. Um, and I will now pass it on to Mason to introduce our wonderful alumni. Amazing. So I just pasted our socials in the chat if anyone wants to find out more about us. And now we can introduce the alumni. So first, we have Nazima, and she graduated from McMaster in 2020 with a BA in English and, and Culture Studies. She is currently the Bilingual Career Development Practitioner at the YMCA in Greater Halifax and Dartmouth. Nazima, you are our most recent graduate from the class. So what was that like? I am sorry, could you repeat that last piece again? Cause you kind of cut out a little. Oh, sorry. I just <laughs> mentioned that you are our most recent graduate. So I was wondering how that was graduating in 2020. Um, intense. <laughs> it was um, very sad, I'm not gonna lie. Um, when I got that email that we were having no more classes and no more convocation, I was very um, depressed. <laughs> Um, because McMaster was my dream school and I literally moved to Canada to go to McMaster and walk the stage <laughs> after I graduated and picked my um, degree or diploma. But I did get an email a few weeks ago that they're going to hold a convocation for us uh, for class of 2020 and 2021 uh, for whoever didn't get to walk the stage. 
So yeah, but um, it was for sure um, disappointing because of the pandemic. <laughs> of course, that must have been tough, but I am so excited for you to finally be able to uh, yeah. celebrate that. Yeah, and I'm excited to see you guys here. Um, I actually started the first uh, English cultural English uh, society with a bunch of friends and we were talking to professors and asking for funding and to see where it got to two years later, especially with everything that it's that has been going through with shutdowns and lockdowns and pandemic and online. I'm very proud of you guys and I'm very excited. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, of course. Oh, it's so nice to see us all you know, pursuing it after the hard work you did at the beginning. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll next uh, introduce Celeste, who is currently a reporter for the CBC, and she graduated from Mac in 2016 with a BA in English and Poli Sci. So Celeste, you started at CBC as an intern, and now you're at the front of the camera. So could I quickly ask you, how did you find that position with them? Was it a LinkedIn or a job board thing? Or how was that? I wish it was that easy. <laughs> that would save me a lot of time and probably money. Um, also, hi, everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, how did I find that job? So I actually, after my undergraduate, I took some time off to kind of figure out what I wanted to do. I was toggling between law school and a journalism postgrad. And apparently, um, I just like less money and more work. Um, so I picked journalism school. And then I applied for a really competitive internship at CBC, of course, everybody who well, most people I would say that want to be a journalist in this country want to start at the CBC or get their foot in the door. So I applied for an internship and I got in and I started as an intern in the health unit, which was way out of my wheelhouse, but it was a really, really cool experience. So I kind of played reporter for six weeks and then I got humbled really hard when I begged around the office for a job. And uh, the only thing they would give me was an editorial assistant, which sounded cool. And I was ready. I was like, cool. This sounds like a reporter gig. Um, I ended up rolling the prompter and printing scripts for the anchor for about... I would say on and off for a year. And then I kind of worked my way up from there. And I told everyone in the newsroom, I was going to be a reporter and they were like, good luck with that. And I said, okay, just wait. And then now here I'm doing this in Ottawa. That's a little, that's as simple as I can put it. <laughs> that sounds difficult and yet you've accomplished it and it sounds amazing. So that's so great. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, the humbling bit. That's at least you're being realistic with us. <laughs> I will not sugarcoat anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay. And lastly, I'll just introduce Alexander, who graduated with a BA in English and Cultural Studies in 2016, and then got his MA in English in 2017. And you're currently a PhD candidate at Western, and you're a contributing editor at the Literary Review Canada. So Alexander, that's awesome. And I see that you were also in a band, which is quite cool. Can you tell us a bit about that little side hobby and how maybe that intersects with your love of English and culture studies? Um, I could tell you about it, but it would be better if you came to see it and hear it uh, this Saturday at the Corktown Pub in Hamilton, Ontario. As a matter of fact, one of our first shows post COVID. Um, yeah, as for how it intersects with the... Uh, uh, the English, um, it actually doesn't intersect at all. And that's why I like it because it's a whole completely different environment where, um, uh, you know, I can, um, I don't know, let my hair down. You know what I'm saying? Versus uh, academia. So it's nice to have two different worlds, which is kind of, uh, you know, I like being in that in-between position. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, the, uh, the name of the band. The band's called Rolodex Darko. And I should say that after my MA, we, uh, I, we did the Warp Tour. We went around Canada. We did some cool stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's it for the band, man. I, I don't want to eat up too much time. Okay. Um, that sounds amazing. And don't worry. Eating up time, no problem. Maybe put the name in the chat so that well. <laughs> If you're yeah, trying I'll to gain that. traction for the Saturday show. Um, yeah, I am. <laughs> um, okay, great. It's great to meet you all. And after the short intros, I thought we I would like to start off with asking the real questions. Um, so I would first like to ask, this is pretty broad, but necessary. How did you get to where you are today? <laughs> uh, did you see yourself working or living where you are now? Um, after you had graduated or was it unpredictable? So what's going on now and what were you thinking about it? Maybe I can start with Celeste since you're 
right here on my screen for me. I must admit it's weird being on this side of the questions. I'm usually the one giving them. So bear with me here. Um, where I am now, is it unpredictable is what you asked? And did I see yes. this happening? Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, <laughs> I no, simple answer. I did not see this happening. I, um, I really thought I was going to go to law school. That was kind of something I wanted to do ever since I saw the movie Legally Blind. I was like, that's going to be me. <laughs> I'm not lying. That was, yeah. And then I applied and I got into a couple of schools in the UK and I really wanted to just kind of get out of Ontario, but then I kind of followed my passion of writing and reading and public speaking. So I tried to figure out where that could take me. And I actually, it kind of led uh, a blog I was writing for actually led to me going into journalism. I thought it was really fun. I like writing a lot. Um, and then as for how I got here, no, I guess that part wasn't very predictable, but I was really determined. So I told everyone I knew that I was going to go do a postgraduate in journalism. I was going to be a reporter. And now here I am. So it just takes a lot of hard work and also going with the flow of things, I would say, too, like just be open to ideas and and uh, take things as they come. But yeah. That sounds amazing that I can I can see how letting the unpredictability of it and just going where it takes you can be really helpful as we as we go into the workforce. Scary and helpful. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nazima, could I ask you the same yes, question? Of course. Um, like Celeste, it was unpredictable again because of COVID. I wanted to travel the world and see um, things before I started my master's, which was supposed to start in early 2021. And it did. Um, but then I got stuck at home. So I decided I need to look for something. <laughs> I can't just stay like there like this and take a uh, serve benefit or whatever they were giving at that time. Um, but as much as um, as difficult as it was, um, it was very rewarding. And I got to that point by connecting to people. Um, like I came into this appointment today or this event today thinking that the first thing I'm gonna say or mention is connections and networking. Um, it's obviously you can't find jobs if you go online and apply to them or submit your resumes here and there, but connections and networking um, were my main like source of um, helpful or the most helpful resource that I got um, as I was finding this position. Um, so I did a lot of networking. I asked a lot of people. I actually went to the YMCA and I became a client with them. So the work that I used that, that I'm doing right now was um, my case manager before me. So I sat down with a career counselor. I talked to them. I told them what I wanted to do. I wanted to work in a diverse community or diverse environment where I could, you know, um, learn about people just like I did at McMaster. I love the diversity of, of campus. I love meeting different people. I love, you know, sharing stories. So it was either going into like teaching, doing ESL teaching and, and meeting newcomers and new people, which was actually what I was doing for my master's after. Um, or this job, when it came up, they were like, would you like to give it a try and see, you know, if, you know, it would be a good fit for you. And I went for it. So... So then you do recommend being, having the experience of, of like having the service that you end up working for in your field, being on that other side first and then joining them. Um, that was helpful for you? Definitely. Because when I walked in the role, there was training, obviously, but there were a lot of like new terminology and new um, words to me that I didn't, I wouldn't have known or wouldn't have guessed what they meant exactly. Uh, if I wasn't a client in the first place. So being a client and working with a career counselor and it's completely free service because why the YMCA is a nonprofit organization um, <clears throat> helped me a lot with um, my transition into doing the job actually. So That's both sides, like being, trying both to be both honest. sides is very helpful for sure. Okay. And I can see how that would apply for a lot of English students as um, libraries, YMCA, school, a lot of the public services that we use, um, exactly. we already use them as the service. And now we could be the servicers, ser ser you know, <laughs> once exactly. we graduate. Servers kind of. Servers. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Alexander, uh, do you have any thoughts on how, how you are today and how you got there? Um, okay. So when Einstein was working on the quantum, right? 
we all are aware of Einstein, all right? Um, people told him, they said, you know, what are you doing? They said, uh, you should be focusing on the problems of the world. And why are you not focusing on poverty and the material conditions of society, etc.? And Einstein persevered. And as a result, we now have GPS, we now have satellites, we now have lasers, we have those cell phones no one ever puts down. And it's all because of that. And so that is to say that the direct path is not necessarily the desirable path, right? There are many ways to travel this road we call life. And I actually think you should remain open to unpredictability. I think it's actually a very bad thing if you get too locked into one pathway and you should be happy to take left and right turns on your way. So for me, I had no idea what I was gonna do. I worked as a chocolatier. I was a medieval times knight for uh, one day. It didn't last long. The hair didn't really work with me. Um, and uh, I think it was great because it made me a more interesting person and a better writer as a result and a more interesting uh, academic guy, right? So the more experience you get and the more willing you are to push yourself outside of your comfort zone, I think that the healthier uh, that is for your, uh, your uh, I don't know, joie de vivre. <laughs> That's really interesting. And I also, I didn't work for medieval times, but I did apply to work there. Um, <laughs> I got a call back and then I realized it's medieval times, um, which I mean in the most amazing way. I would probably faint out of excitement every day if I worked there. Um, <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, can I just inter interrupt you for a second? It was the worst job ever. It was a terrible- Okay, thing. okay, okay. It was so <laughs> bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no one should ever work there. It was really bad. It was, uh, we don't need to get into like the tales of my knighthood for a day, but like, <laughs> oh God, shoveling dung, man, is really not all it's cracked up to be. I did that for two summers. Not oh, at medieval times. Yeah, I shoveled horse stuff at, <laughs> at a, yeah, it was my, one of my first jobs in university actually for two summers. And my brother and my dad bet me that I couldn't last two weeks. And I'm somebody, don't tell me that I can't do something because I'll purposely prove you wrong. And I did it for two summers. So just a little tip there. <laughs> we have so much in common, so much in common. <laughs> yeah, we're all taking notes right now <laughs> over that. Yeah. Um, avoid, here's a note, everyone. Avoid jobs with copious amounts of dung slinging. That's a note you should. Manual all. labor in general. Yeah, yeah. avoid manual labor. <laughs> <laughs> If, if so, you, both of you just mentioned that you had kind of weirdest jobs um, or things that didn't align with what, you, what you'd be doing now. Did any of you switch programs or did any of you take, you know, completely different fields that, that you didn't expect? Yeah, you're, you're raising your hand. What was it? I actually started there? in uh, engineering, which is <laughs> very interesting. And a lot of people, when I tell them that, they're like, what? Engineering to English? Uh, but where I come from, a lot of people don't understand is where I come from, you either have to be a doctor or an engineer. <laughs> and it wasn't like until I came here, actually, that I realized, oh, there are other professions in life. <laughs> so growing up um, in Kuwait, which is where I'm originally from, I used to read a lot of English books, even though English was not my first language at all. I would just pick the books up. And, and I, uh, after I did my first year of engineering, I realized that I'm miserable and I hated this. So I decided to switch to what I was originally passionate about. And I was like, oh, English literature sounds good. Let me see if I will enjoy a program that's about stories and books. And, um, and I did. <laughs> I was like, best decision of my life ever. That is amazing. And that, that is the switch. <laughs> the good, right? That's amazing. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, anyone else program switches or career switches in your audio there just got a little DJ like yeah oh, you might have to repeat the end That's, of that Mason that is beautiful yeah no it's saying your internet connection is unstable uh if amazing if it keeps cutting out Mason just let me know and I can uh read off any other questions if it okay. becomes too much of an issue okay great thanks um yeah I was just gonna Say, did anyone else have any career switches or um, program changes? I added on to my program, I would say, which in hindsight was a silly thing to do because if I was, whatever I end up doing now, or if I was an, end up going to law school, uh, an undergrad in English would have sufficed. But I was like, mm, let's add poli sci to that. 
for a no reason. Um, so that would be the only switch I made, but I think it was a good one because it was a good contrast between the two. Like, yes, they're kind of similar in the sense of the workload you're doing essays and presentations and all that kind of stuff, but it, it gave me a different life perspective and it ended up being some of the, my favorite material that I actually did study in university. So that was good. I originally had econ as well as English in first year. And that lasted, uh, well, longer than a day, but, uh, it should have lasted a day. Not for me. A day at medieval times and a day in econ. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing a trend. <laughs> a trend of the things lasting a day in my life. Um, okay. Those, that's all very good insight on switching your minds. Um, what about looking at the end of the program you finally decided on, all of you? Um, what are some tips that you decide, you'd recommend for graduating English and Cultural Studies students who are looking to get into the workforce upon graduation? So what's a tip for someone graduating from English? Um, anyone who'd like to start, or I could just say... You can facilitate it. Just call on whoever you want. Okay, Nazima. Sure. Um, uh, again, networking, I'd say, even before you um, go out, try to um, meet as many people as you can or talk to as many people as you can. I know it could be difficult sometimes to put yourself out there. Um, I always had, um, I was always conscious about English not being my first language. So I would always um, still till this day, even though I work every day and I've been in Canada for seven years, I still have those thoughts that I'm, what did I say? Did I say something wrong? Did I say something that sounded dumb? But um, you need that little push or a little kick to go out and put yourself out there and talk to as many people as you can. Um, talk to the English society people. I'm pretty sure they have the best resources and options around. We loved when we were in the society, we loved having the students coming to us and asking us questions. And even if we didn't know the answer, we would look for resources around to help and connect with people as much as we can or connect people with each other as much as you can. That's like my biggest advice for sure. Perfect. Um, Alexander? Um, be wary that in entering the workforce, the workforce doesn't enter into you, which is to say, do not lose your sense of self in pursuit of uh, a place in other people. Um, I think that is uh, my biggest piece of advice. Okay. And uh, Celeste? Just to build off that, um, my biggest piece of advice would just be like, you don't have to have it all figured out as soon as you graduate. You really, really don't. Like, I remember distinctly this one meltdown of many that I've had in my life, even in this week, um, when I went to my parents after I graduated and I was working, I don't know, I think I was a bartender or something at that point, some odd random job that you get after university. And I was like, what in the hell am I going to do with my life? Like, what am I going to do? Where is my CEO position? Where is my full-time contract for what job? I don't know, but you have this notion when you do an undergrad that you're going to come out and have this job full-time ready to go kickstart your life. And it's just going to happen. It's not the case. And mm -hmm. if it doesn't happen, some, some of my friends, it did, they've been working in the same job that they had since they graduated and other people don't. And I feel like when you're in the arts, um, there's a little bit more, not necessarily of a struggle, but there, it's a little harder. You didn't go to school for engineering. You didn't go to school for nursing. So your direction is a little bit more, I don't know, go where the wind will take you, I should say, but definitely just be patient with the process and definitely be open. Um, and you're going to work for the next 50, uh, I want to puke at the thought of 50 years of your life. Like do not rush into getting a career, take your time. I've switched my mind so many times in that brief period that I took off before I actually ended up going back to school. So yeah, just don't think you have to have it all figured out because I still work with people. I work with people to this day that are in their forties that don't know what the hell they're doing. So that's the only thing I can say from my meltdown to where I am now, you don't have to have it figured out. 100% agree. And comforting to hear that you're still having meltdowns um, while you're in the field. I had two this morning, <laughs> two this morning. And okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. I'm good though. Don't worry. We're good. Oh, no, no. Amazing. <laughs> um, I've also like gone to office hours, talked to profs and they're like, yeah, I, I don't know. Like I still, I'm still confused. I'm still, I'm like, okay, good. You're in your fifties, sixties and you 
Thank God. <laughs> yeah, no, I listen. I was on Indeed today being like, what else can I do with my life? <laughs> Believe me, it's everyone's just, if you think people have it together, everybody is faking it. So just know that much. I fake it every day. Indeed can be indeed very helpful. Um, about, <laughs> jumping off that, are there, I, I'm not, I'm not an Indeed lover, but are there, I feel like it's like difficult to navigate, but are there a lot of, are there any websites like those or, you know, LinkedIn is, is a staple, but anything like that, that you heavily rely on any of you? Celeste, you said, I, I feel like Indeed was like a side comment, but how, <laughs> what, yeah. what else do you like to go on? Um, I, well, the thing is, I don't know if I can say this broadly, but at least it worked out to my advantage. I am a firm believer in contacting the head of whoever company you want to work at, emailing, annoying people. That's how I got my first job at CBC is I was in this one little unit of the CBC in Toronto. And then I emailed a ton of execs that were in this giant building being like, can I get a job? Can I get a job? And then I met with someone and I I sold myself. And it really is at the end of the day, a lot about selling yourself, no matter what the job is. So I like those Indeed websites, those LinkedIn, they're getting a million applications every single time that there's a job posting. I like to go directly to the source. And maybe that's something that's just kind of intuitive with the job that I do now, but I'd go right to the person. You're not annoying people. They will think it's showing initiative. They will, you'll stand out. Some people might not like that. You might be annoying. I don't know, but I, I don't have time to wait. So I go right to the person if you can. And then obviously, of course, what Nazima said is networking and knowing people. It really is a lot about who you know, um, in a lot of cases, I would say. But yeah, I like going right to the source. I definitely agree. That's exactly what I tell my clients when they come to me and they feel like, oh, I've been applying for weeks on Indeed or LinkedIn and I haven't been getting any calls back. And I'm like, did you contact someone in the company? Did you go on the company website? That's like something that you should really consider and keep in mind because definitely like you said you're not bothering anybody that it's going to show that you have initiative and you're ready to show that you have the skills to do the job and that kind of stuff definitely and also let me add to that too at the same time it's not necessarily a waste of time to apply on indeed as well i mean i ended up getting my job at the literary review of canada because i'd applied for some position at a corporate communications firm because I was just applying to every single thing I could through Indeed, through LinkedIn, whatever. And I had an interview there and I, you know, I, 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 I wrote a cover letter that I did in 10 minutes and it was about Santa crashing in North Korea and the reindeer liberating the country. And I got a call from whoever the person was who was watching uh, these, these applications come in and they were like, we don't know who you are, but you're, you're really weird and we really need to meet you. And so I went in and a big panel of people interviewed me and it came down to me and some other person and they chose the other person because <laughs> quote, I would be too hard to control quote. But um, uh, anyway, one of the people on that panel ended up becoming the editor in chief of the LRC later, remembered how zany I was and uh, said, I want you to, you know, uh, work here. So I ended up getting a job there. And uh, now I get to review books by Hillary Clinton in the LRC, which is fun. So, uh, yeah, I would, you know, don't cut off any avenue. There's another piece. Don't leave any stone unturned. I'm full of cliches tonight. And I think that's also a lesson in embrace the zane and the inner zaniness. <laughs> Absolutely. In that if it, if it can get you a job, then I wouldn't, would you say that you shouldn't suppress your um personality or humor or anything mm -hmm. um when you're in when you're looking around for these things i think english in particular having a personality in this field would be very helpful to like uh spread spread more mm -hmm. humanness well yeah yeah absolutely for the jobs you want you don't want to work somewhere where you're an automaton at least i don't so if they don't you know if they don't want to hire you because you have too much personality fine their loss go work somewhere else <laughs> <laughs> I second that for sure. For, for sure. sure. A lot of people get okay. jobs based on their personality too, might I add. Like yeah. you don't know how to do anything, you have no skills, but again, sell yourself. Yeah. I don't know. Likeable gets you a long way. It's very true. And I I noticed that when I started working with my team, I realized that I can click with a lot of people in my team. And I realized, oh, they saw that I was a great fit because this team is kind of similar to who I am too, right? So sure. once you get there, you'll realize that too. That's a good point.
Mm -hmm. And I would even wonder um, if it would also be to embrace any differences in yourself. I know that's also cliche, but I was just thinking that Nizima, you were saying that English is not your first language. And I, I'm wondering how does that benefit you? How do you take advantage or how do you use that to your, um, to help you to your advantage? It actually benefited me a lot for this role. I, um, so I was actually the first person hired ever for this kind of position. They had case managers or career practitioners, but they never had an Arabic uh, speaking career practitioner and they were looking for someone given the fact that um, Canada or Halifax where I'm at right now is becoming more and more diverse with all the new um, Arabic speaking newcomers so they were looking for someone who had this like cultural background or knew the language but also was open to working with a um, diverse group of people it helps me tremendously I um, do the job translating um, and helping um, Arabic speaking clients with their um, employment uh, journey so um, at the end of the day the source of my most uh, fear of, of like speaking or saying something wrong became my biggest asset in what I'm doing every day um, so yeah but it, it was a little um, challenging at the beginning with the clients because I didn't kind of understand how to address the language barrier I was looking at myself and I thought that everybody learned the same way I did <laughs> so it was a little difficult um, I took my time and I sat down with like my team members and then I asked I always tell everybody that comes to me asking for advice as well I'm like there is no harm in asking questions if you think that you have a dumb question then you're there's you know you need to sit down and, and talk yourself um, otherwise, because asking questions always get you where you need to get or get you somewhere closer to where you need to get. So sitting down, asking people questions and, and um, figuring it out as you go through. <laughs> but yeah, my language, my first language is definitely a big asset for um, what I do every day. That's super inspiring for anyone coming to Canada or even um, being in Canada and having another their mother tongue with their family that can be a really great help what I feel like that would be one strategy of, of accepting um, accepting like that um, part of yourself and using that as an asset uh, can I ask what other strategies have you found useful or what other things have you done that you found useful or helpful to transition from university to post-grad life, be it in the workplace, in your creative space, in your post-grad study, or just what has helped you for, during that transition? Um, Celeste, can I ask you that? Oh gosh, um, other things that have helped me in my postgraduate and creative life. Oh gosh. Um, we could come back to you. <laughs> all I can say is just go for it. Like, what do you really, I, I, that's kind of been my mentality. I, I, and also just setting goals. If you want to be somewhere you see yourself, I don't know, for me, it was, like I said, when I did journalism, I was like, I'm going to work at the CBC and I'm going to be a reporter. You have to set goals for yourself. And even if they're small, they don't have to be your five, 10 year plan or whatever the case may be. It's um, just kind of setting small goals and getting there. As for creatively, um, I have a blog on the side that I like to write for whenever I find the time. And I'm sure most of the people that are on this call, they, we all have kind of creative outlets. That's, that's a the joy of being, I don't know, an uh, art student, I guess, or an arts alumni, uh, is just put your stuff, stuff out there. There's some things that I've sat on or I've held back because I cared about what people think, don't care about what people think. The internet's a big place. Um, there's a lot of room for everyone to be creative. There's a book by this woman I just read. It's called Big Magic. It's by the author who wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And she just talks about life is very short, but it can also be very long in the sense that it's like, if you want something, go after it. And if you want to be creative, there's room for everybody and definitely pursue those, those ventures. I would say if that was helpful at all, I'm not sure, but that's all I can say. Immensely. So thank you. And just a bit of a digression before I ask the same question to your co-panelists. Um, you just mentioned that one of that, one of the goals you had was I'm going to be a journalist at CBC um, or a reporter at CBC. And you said in an earlier answer, um, I'm, I'm trying to like connect the dots here, um, that you, that a lot of people in your field also think that's like a great spot to get your first internship because that's like the peak of reporting. Did you find 
that that was I mean clearly you still work there so it worked out but what what are your thoughts on having a goal for the top place that it, in the field or the top school or having an aspiration that is very well known or aiming to get to that point do you think that's very helpful or uh, very good for directing you in the right direction or how can others um, do it differently do it differently I think it also honestly depends on the kind of person you are and your work ethic. To be quite honest, I am not somebody that's motivated um, really by other people necessarily. I'm more motivated by people who tell me I can't do things as I've previously mentioned. And a lot of people, even to this day, told me that I would never be a reporter and not for any reasons of my skill set. It's just a very competitive environment. And everyone who wants to be a journalist, like I said, wants to be a journalist at the CBC. Um, so if it is for you setting those long-term goals or those those high points, then definitely go for it. It's, it's not to say it can't be achieved, but it definitely is going to take a lot of hard work. And for me, I'm somebody that always has to have something like a next step, which for some people it works and other people it doesn't. For me, I need to have something lined up and ready to go to achieve. Otherwise, I just lose momentum, I think. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but definitely shoot for the stars, aim for the moon. Is that what they say? I don't know. <laughs> I'm stealing yeah. out these uh, cliches tonight, so... <laughs> No, well, it, it is, that's, I'm so glad that that works for you. And it's great to speak from your experience. I think that would be a great strategy for a lot of people. Um, could I ask um, Alexander what a strategy for you has been when you're transitioning from university to post-grad life? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's good to aim high, just as long as you're not named Icarus. Um, I think, um, uh Okay, for one thing, I think keeping an agenda is a good habit that I, I kept in university and I still do now. Keep on, and that sounds so banal, I know, but like, you know, keep on top of things and setting goals is good, but goals also um, should be, you know, quantitative. Like they should have, you should have some kind of, um, I don't know, st statistic or some kind of measure that you can you can then see how close you're getting to that goal. Like your the goals you're setting should not be some wishy-washy, like I wanna be the biggest actor. Like that doesn't mean anything. Like, you know, I wanna, it's, I, do, I wanna have this many, I wanna be in this many plays this year or something, right? Like, so when you're setting these goals, have them be something you can keep track of and you can measure your progress. And, and so that's one strategy would be to, Good to set goals, good to aim high, but make sure you're setting the right kind of goals, goals that you can actually um, uh, measure, right? So, okay, there's one, there's one strategy. <laughs> That's a good strategy. My life is all over the place personally. So like me giving advice for other people's life is very hard, <laughs> but I'm just saying, <laughs> you know, go for it. That's how I feel about most things. Just go for it. And if you fail, whatever. That's a good I one am. too. Yeah. Just go for it. Man. Yeah. The biggest advice that I wish I learned in university and I actually took to heart is like, I'm going to swear, don't give a shit about what people think. Don't care about the outcome. That's Literally just do it and go for it. Life is so short. Life is so, so short. Really. I agree 100%. I spend a lot of time and energy um, thinking about what other people think or um, why they said this or why this, especially switching from engineering to English, which is what I'm passionate about, and I've heard it till this day. Oh, what have you done with your life and career? What um, I got to a point where yeah, I realized that my life is my life, and I'm the only person that I'm gonna live my life. Nobody else is gonna. So if you keep that kind of sentence or mentality in your head, and it's just gonna be easier. Just don't care what others say. Yeah. I agree. How and this is for all of you, as you've all concurred. How do you not? care about what other people are saying or not care about what people think um what what is like a tangible thing you could do to be like just do it just just do the goal just do your thing how do you not listen to that what what do any of you do <laughs> listen I, I dish out advice doesn't mean I take it okay <laughs> let's be real here um no well I'll, I'll jump in um I think you have to teach yourself that people aren't as occupied or not um enthralled or invested in your life as you might think and for somebody who's in the public eye and not even to a great scale really like I'm still an up-and-coming kind of reporter if I stick with this kind of career path um people really really don't care about what you're doing they really really don't and they might for a second but they'll forget about it so just do what you're, you planned on doing anyway and just go for it um I got to a point where I realized that 
what whatever you do, there's always going to be like comments, <laughs> like mm-hmm. whether it was something that they said you should do or they said you shouldn't do, there's always going to be a negative comment around it. So there is no way in satisfying like people or, or um, agreeing with them 100%. Um, for me, I would just, I take a, a moment to sit down and think deeply and, and imagine myself how I would feel taking that next step that I want to take. Do I feel excited? Do I get that rush? Or do I feel nervous and stressed? Feeling nervous is a little good too, because, you know, it means that it feels real and it feels strong, feel that strong about it. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's how I do it. I sit down and I try to kind of analyze how I feel with with the, with the next step that I want to take. And I go ahead um, doing so. And I try to like block everything else that comes my way it's just me and about me and my choice and my life again so I I just become very selfish and self-centered at that moment I love that also I mean yeah don't worry about what other people think because you can't know what they're thinking anyway right Mm -hmm. Um, you know consciousness this is a Sartre being in nothingness consciousness is an absolute interiority we can't know what someone else is thinking anyways. So there's no point in worrying about what you can't control, but you know yourself and you know um, your own consciousness, your own being in itself. So lean into that, lean into what you do know, which is ultimately your greatest asset as a university student and you know yourself. And if you're honest with yourself, that in theory reflects out anyway. So there's no point in dwelling on uh, somebody else's opinion that, you can only at best approximate anyways, right? Even just building off that, I just going back to my university days and how I said, I literally told everyone with a heartbeat that I was going to be a lawyer. <laughs> um, and it's really okay to change your mind. I, I want that to be super clear. You have to do what you want to do and what's going to make you happy. And what's unfortunately, fact of the matter is what's going to pay your bills at the end of the day. You know what I mean? So definitely just do what makes you happy and do what you want to do. I would say, don't care about letting on anyone else down except for yourself. And, oh, you know, what? here's something else. Let me add something else here going off that. Let's go. Um, yeah, this is good. We're getting some dialogue going now. Um, uh, you know what? I think being unhappy can be very good, too. I think that uh, unhappiness can often be the stimulant for growth. And so if you allow yourself to be unhappy, if you put yourself in situations where you are uncomfortable, where you are um, not necessarily at ease, that can push you in unexpected directions, right? There can be um, opportunities that arise from placing yourself into positions of deliberate unhappiness or at least unease or something, right? So it's not necessarily about being happy all the time. It's about being satisfied. I think there's a difference between the two. Yeah, I like that. Definitely. Yes, very well said, all of you. Um, That is amazing. And I think um much of what all three of you just said can tie to what um uh, having an english or more broadly humanities degree would have taught you i feel like these are uh, skills and qualities that you would have developed in the four plus years of being in school at least that's what i would uh that's what i would reckon so can i ask you as the final question before we talk we hear some questions from our participants, um, seeing as we're nearing 10 minutes to eight. Um, I'd like to finally ask, in what ways do you think that having, what other ways do you think uh, having an English or humanities degree has shaped your life professionally and personally? Uh, Nazima? Um, I would say um, having an English degree shaped my life tremendously. Um, like Master or like just my degree in general is always going to be a part of me that is always going to be present in every next step or phase. Even when I went and I did my master's, um, my master was still behind in the background or my English degree was still in the background. I did my master's in education, if just to say like it's a little different than English. Um English shaped me in a way where it made me question things. It made me comfortable asking why and um, how. Um, It made me comfortable sitting down on a table, like, for example, in my seminars or in my final honors year course and and with different people from different backgrounds and different beliefs and debate um, what um, is should be or shouldn't be 
right? So it gave me that push where I can speak up my mind and and um, kind of be a little more brave than I used to be when I was in engineering, definitely. <laughs> so yeah, it's um, it changed my life in that way. And that definitely, I saw that after graduation because it definitely determined um, what I wanted to do next in my um, academic life and career wise, because I felt comfortable doing this because I have the skills to do this, or I felt, you know, okay doing that because I learned in English that it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to debate what's, what should and shouldn't be again. Yeah. If that makes sense. I'm not sure. <laughs> it totally does. Thank you. Uh, Celeste, do you have any thoughts on how it shaped you? Um, professionally, I mean, the obvious is that I end up pursuing a career in, in writing and reading and speaking for a living. Um, I definitely think it also taught me to think critically. I think that was such a key takeaway from my four years in university is to think of the world in a different way and ask questions. Uh, and also I would say, well, I'll pivot to personally, it just further solidified my love for reading and writing and literature and how many people have been doing it for centuries before us and we'll do it for centuries after us. It's just a cool, it's a really cool thing to study. And for anyone who tells you you can't get a job with a degree in English, I mean, there's three people sitting on this panel that, you know, have exactly that. So um, yeah, I just, I really, really enjoyed my time at McMaster. And I don't know when you guys pick courses for your fourth year. I don't remember the timeline of anything, but I would just also encourage you to take courses that you might not think you would like. That kind mm -hmm. of just something piques your interest just a little bit because the courses I end up enjoying the most in English end up being things I didn't think I would like at all, mm -hmm. like biblical literature. And I took a course called like Kafka-esque or something like that. It was about Fran Franz Kafka. I'm, Wait, were you, you were in that course with me with Cyrus Birds? In what? Uh, were you with me in that? It was a fourth year seminar with Irish Bruce. Were you in that? Kafka What's after it? Kafka? Yeah, that uh, was it a woman or a man? Yeah, it was a woman. Uh, the Dr. Irish Bruce was the prof. I think we might have been in that seminar together. <laughs> 2016, I guess. Yeah, yeah, 2016, because we start, both started in 2012. Yeah, I guess maybe. And that <laughs> oh was a God. small class. Yeah, oh my God. Wow. Connections being made. But um, that was a really cool class. So that's all I would say. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kafka is great, man. Um, oh, yeah, I guess I should go. Okay. Um, ways it shaped my life. Um, professionally, obviously, I review books. So, I mean, I, the training I got in an English degree, um, reading and writing and all that is, is uh, coming in very handy. Um, and uh, personally, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, I guess... It, doing an English degree at Mac, it afforded me four and five, because I did an MA, five years to, to familiarize myself with perspectives that I otherwise would never have understood. Because ultimately, each text is like a crucible that melts together, right? And all these um, multifarious disciplines, these perspectives, these historical moments, and then the job of you as the critic is to pull that apart again and kind of articulate, you know, what the significance might be of those various strands that are together in this, this sort of solid text that we look at. Um, so I think realizing the value of that process of, of ha being afforded the time to take an extended look at some of these other perspectives is, um, you know, really a bedrock of critical thinking as uh, my, my co-panelists have said. So I think personally it's, it's engendered a respect for other perspectives that I would never have otherwise had access to. And that's why everybody should do an English degree. <laughs> well, said. <laughs> well said. Amazing. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, I was gonna say amazing way to end off my questions. Um, and it looks like we have some questions in the chat and hopefully some more. So Sarah, would you like to take over part of the student Q&A? Yes, um, so I had just put in the chat there, but for any participants who are uh, wanting to ask a question, you can uh, type it into the chat now, or uh, if you feel comfortable, just raise your hand and uh, you can unmute and ask the question yourself. Um, we have one question here from Claire. Um, do any of you think you might pivot in your career goals in the near future? And uh, as a question for sort of all three of our panelists, but Claire also adds um, for Nazima, 
you mentioned you were interested in ESL and teaching and maybe a master's. Have you ruled out uh, these options completely? Uh, no, uh, actually, I completed my master's. I'm about to graduate and um, go to my convocation in June. <laughs> so um, uh, I was able to do that while I was working full time because the master's was, was fully online. So I was like on a full um, work and school schedule. Um, turned out good for me. So um, eventually in the future, I do believe that I'm moving my role at the YMCA from case management to uh, facilitation and ESL for newcomers, because we do have a lot of like um, ESL programs and English education programs. So um, yeah, no, um, and the, the one thing that a lot of people don't realize is when you do an English degree, you have so many options when you graduate and it's so flexible. You can do so many things with it and it could be overwhelming at some point, but once you sit down, you know, you realize what you like to do, what you don't like to do, um, it becomes so much easier um, like now. So I can just do my, the work that I'm doing right now and then I will pivot and move to the next step, which is uh, facilitating or teaching classes. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, Alexander or Celeste, did you have um, anything to add on to that? Um, have either of you um, uh, thought of pivoting in your career goals? Every day. <laughs> <laughs> You can go first, Alexander. Uh, um, let me. Whenever I hear the word pivot, I immediately think of friends. Just first of all, which is like, yeah, this I was up. also thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I needed to just word, bring though. that up. Uh, so yeah, who's this, Claire Marie? Thank you for using that word. Um, yeah. Um, uh, no, because I'm in the middle of a PhD, so I'm probably going to be here for another two, three years. Um, so in my near future, I will be in the same apartment. Uh, working on the same dissertation. Um, uh, so that's probably a really unsatisfactory answer to this question, but look, I'm honest and the answer is absolutely not. So now uh, Celeste can go and say every day. <laughs> um, pivot in my goals. Well, I just, I have a plan in mind of where I want my career to kind of go. And I'm still open along the way of where things shift. Um, I guess I'll speak it into existence, but I one day want to host my own show. Like I would really love to have my own current affairs kind of deal, whether that be, I don't know, a talk show, radio show, something like that. Um, but then again, if I don't know, I one day change my mind and decide to be a recluse and run away and work at a cafe and just be a full-time writer, then believe me, that's on my mind regularly. I would love to do that. Um, Got to marry rich first, but yeah, I think it's good to always, uh, like I said before, make goals for yourself, uh, realistic, attainable goals, as Alexander kind of pointed out earlier. But yeah, I'm always kind of just, I don't know if you don't, for me personally, I get bored really, really easily. I, mm -hmm. I'm always someone who needs to be on the go and setting, I don't know, goals, like I said, and just kind of getting after it and doing new things and always try. I never say no to like, I, for instance, I host the, or not host, I uh, do the weather every Friday. I clearly have a degree in English, so I did not go to climatology school or meteorology, and I just bake it every Friday, and I didn't say no to that job, and it's definitely, it's helped me in other ways, too, so don't say no to anything along the lines, and just always be open to other things. That's all I can say. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Hiru, I see we have a question, and we'll have uh, another one in the chat there if we can get to it, but Hiru, uh, your hand's been up for quite a while, so Feel free to unmute and ask your question. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I have a question for Alex um, because your job is probably like my dream job. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, where I want to be like someday. But um, I want to ask like as a contributing editor, um, what would you say is like the most challenging aspect of your job? And like, if more specifically, is there anything you felt like your degree in English didn't really like prepare you for that you had to like learn on the job? Hmm. Yeah, what I had to learn on the job. Um, okay, well, let me answer both parts. So the, uh, <laughs> the most challenging part of being a contributing editor, so I'll give you a quick sketch. The way that I got that position was I started much like uh, uh, Celeste, as an editorial assistant. So I was hired as an editorial assistant. And the magazine I work for is very small. It's the, it's the LRC, it's, it's our country's national book review magazine and like four people work there. 
<laughs> the state of books in this country. Anyway, so I work, I worked there. And after a few months, they promoted me to assistant editor. And then I got promoted again a few years later. So um, you'll have to work your way up no matter kind of, I mean, it's very unlikely you get hired right off the bat for kind of, you know, the, you know, Celeste position or Nazimas or whatever, right. You're probably gonna have to start on a bottom rung, kind of work your way up and an English degree, um, I guess, prepares you for kind of the workload, but the existential angst of like, oh God, I'm stuck in this position. Like, am I ever going to advance? Right. It's like, don't lose hope, I guess. That's something that a university degree really won't prepare you for, but be aware that like, you know, mentally it'll take some kind of fortitude to persevere through um, those early stages of entering the workforce, as we've been saying. Um, and then uh, um, the uh, most difficult part of the job, um, deadlines can be tough in this position because you have to write very quickly. And um, the LRC is interesting because it is extended books coverage. It's the only magazine, as I said, in the country that allows for that anymore. Um, so you're writing extended, um, basically long form journalism about various books, etc. So you are having to read a lot of material very fast and in a lot of depth. And an English degree will help you with that for sure. But, um, you know, <laughs> the stakes are higher, I guess, in the sense of uh, the deadline is kind of the deadline and you really have to meet that or you're, uh, you're toast, as they say. So that might, that might be the trickiest part of the job is just learning how to consume material very quickly and have kind of deep thoughts on it, I guess, would be the toughest part. But yeah, really fun job. Would recommend. <laughs> That's cool. That's great, thank you. Um, and thank you, Hiro, for the question. That was a wonderful question. Um, uh, we have two questions here. Another question from Claire uh, for Celeste. Uh, would you like to share your private blog with us? No pressure, always looking for new reading material. Um, if you'd like to, I, I won't ask you to do it like necessarily right away. Yeah, no, I will like for to, sure. Feel yeah. free to uh, just paste it in the chat. And yeah. um, then we have another question from uh, Yasmin um, for everyone uh, that says, you said you love writing. Have you ever thought of writing your own book? Yes. <laughs> okay. Every single day. It's a work in progress um, with life in school and work. Um, it's just a side thing to do. And it's a side thing that reminds me of my days at McMaster and the books that I've read as I was a student. So um, yes, most definitely. When is it going to happen? I don't know. When is it going to be completed? I don't know. But uh, um, I guess being oh, being a, a, an English student, you're always you know passionate about something. I, I find it, or at, at least from my experience, you know, my, my other English fellows or um, English studies fellows, uh, they were always passionate about something. And and it's a good it's a good idea to to put that passion out um, in writing. Um, whatever it is and however it is like just if you're thinking about writing a book don't think about how good or bad it looks just write what you're passionate about write thoughts down write whatever you're thinking and maybe it turns out into a book someday <laughs> you never know <laughs> yeah I definitely feel that <laughs> um Celeste or Alexander did you have anything to add to that have either of you ever thought of writing your own book well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm kind of doing that now with a, <laughs> with a dissertation, it's 250 pages long. Um, so, you know, when, uh, other than that, sure, maybe one day, but um, I don't know, you gotta, you gotta acquire this, uh, you know, the experience first. I'm still too young. I'm not that much older than you guys. I need to, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not old enough yet. My perspective is, uh, I need more time. I need more time, I think. Uh, yeah, um, we have um, maybe just one, la la the last question I'll say if we have some time, um, if our panelists are okay with one last question. Um, Claire uh, asked, uh, what advice would you give to a person who is struggling to figure out what they want to do post-grad? It's hmm. a really good question. You want to go ahead, Alexander? <laughs> 
<laughs> oh yeah okay Clara or um, Celeste disappeared um yeah what would what, what I get um don't don't feel you have to we've said this already but I'll repeat it I mean don't feel you have to have it figured out already I mean for sure I, yeah I mean there's no you don't have to have your the entire trajectory of your life planned out when you are exactly. 22 or however old you are right yeah. um yeah so this is like Think of it less as an imposition of, I need to figure out what I'm going to do. Oh no. And more of an opportunity of, okay, I just graduated. I'm young. I have, uh, I, I got spunk. I have a degree. Let me explore and see what I want. Right. And so you can, you can, yeah. the, the glass is half full. <laughs> That's so true. Very true. Um, one thing I always tell um, younger students who ask me for help is don't compare your chapter one to somebody's chapter 10 and it's a cheesy quote that I read on Pinterest I think but it stood with me and resonated with me so um, strongly so um, take your time if you're feeling disappointed or like you said you're struggling take the time to feel the struggle it's okay don't try to to prevent it take your time to feel it and go through it it took me six months of of applying to tens of jobs every single day until I found this um, position and I stuck to it so it's and it took other people a year and others two weeks so it's really like your experience with it take your time with it and and try to enjoy the process even though what you're struggling try to enjoy the process as much as you can thank you so much both of you that's so comforting uh and great advice um Les, what do you think <laughs> yeah what they said i just got kicked out i'm sorry <laughs> oh no that's okay um uh we had just one last question, but uh, we're running a little past time. So we'll have okay. to, um, uh, if Celeste, you felt like adding anything uh, really quickly, we had a, what advice would you give to a person struggling to figure out what they want to do uh, post-grad? So uh, I don't know if you have any sort of inspirational quotes or anything you want to quickly share with us um, just to give you an opportunity. <laughs> I trust that my co-panelists covered everything, and I, uh, I kind of said, all I, all the advice I have to give, I have let out to my people here. So, <laughs> hopefully, you took everything I said to, uh, I don't know, to heart. It's just been fun to be here, except for getting kicked out. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, you know the unpredictable nature, as we've been talking about, uh, especially with Zoom. Um, so uh, now that we are coming to the end of our event. Um, We'd like to just sort of mention that the Faculty of Humanities also offers a number of services and activities to support students as they make important career-related decisions and prepare to transition uh, from academics to the workplace. So I posted in the chat, but we'll be sending out an email to uh, participants uh, with some information on career resources uh, at McMaster. Um, we'd also like to take this time to, you know, thank our three panelists for all of the wonderful wisdom and stories that you sh shared with us. Um, that's just truly been uh, uh, really special. So we really appreciate it. Um, we also have a quick survey. We would encourage uh, participants to take uh, after uh, their experience today, um, which the link should be there in the chat, Mason posted it. Um, if you scroll up, it might get lost in the, uh, the thank yous. Um, and once again, just finally, a special thanks to Nasima, Alexander, and Celeste for taking the time to answer our questions and provide just wonderful advice. And as well, a thank you to Nina and her team for helping to organize and facilitate this event. Um, Yes, thank you um, for everything. And uh, we hope you all have a fantastic evening um, for more updates on you know, future events and to stay up to date with everything English and Cultural Studies at McMaster. You can follow us on social media. Uh, our socials, as Mason just posted, are in the chat as well. Um, and uh, that's uh, everything from all of us this evening. And thank you so much to our three panelists. Once again, you've been absolutely wonderful. And we truly appreciate all the advice um, you've given us. It's uh, really a treat and a treasure. <laughs>